Hi everyone and welcome back to the History in 20 podcast. I know it's been a while but I've been pretty busy with some other projects and plenty of new episodes coming your way later this year so hopefully uh, you'll tune in and listen to those ones as well. So today I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Rather than focusing on one historical character, I thought I'd do, like I did before with the 10 Roman emperors, something similar to that. So I had quite a bit of nice feedback recently on my Instagram, which you can find at History in 20 on Instagram, if that's your thing, um, regarding the structure of those episodes. So I thought, like I mentioned earlier, I thought I'd do something pretty similar. And this time, instead of just focusing on Chinese characters, I wanted to focus solely on Chinese women. Because I was looking through the videos on my channel and there's only really Eleanor of Aquitan, who's like the sort of only sole female video that I have got on here so I thought it would be interesting to discover some maybe lesser known characters I'm not sure maybe if you're from China or you're from Asia or you've studied that area you might be familiar with these characters but for me personally I'd only heard of one of them before so like before I did the research obviously not before I'm recording it now that'd be a bit daft wouldn't it but uh yeah I thought I'd do five uh, key figures well, key female figures from medieval China, or if you like, five famous Chinese women from medieval China. So I'm classing medieval China as I would medieval Europe from about the 4th century AD up to about 1500, round about that area anyway. So all of these figures were based within that period. So although when we think of China in this period, we think of it as a heavily male-dominated society, there were still a number of women who more than held their own against those male counterparts and to this day still stand out as key figures in Chinese history. And I'm going to go through these chronologically, starting with the earliest and on to the end. So without further ado, let's start with number one, Princess Pingyang. Um, and she was born round about the 590s and she died in 623. And just a little disclaimer... Uh, I do apologise for any incorrect pronunciations in this because I'm really not familiar with the Chinese language. If you know how to pronounce them correctly, just just let me know, but you'll probably have to bear with me for this episode, I'm afraid. So, uh, Princess Pingyang then, who was she? So, like I said, she was born sometime during the 590s and she was the daughter of Li Wan, who became the founding emperor of the Tang Dynasty, which ruled China from 618 to 690 and then again from 705 to 907. So she famously helped her father seize power from the short-lived Su dynasty, uh, which lasted from 581 to 618. So in 617, Li Wan, who was Princess Pingyang's father, planned to rebel against Emperor Yang of Su as he had previously been imprisoned by him. So he sent a letter to his daughter and her husband, who was a guy called Chai Shao, summoning them back to Taiwan, Taiwan, not Taiwan, as they were both currently in the Su capital of Chang'an. However, Chai Shao was not convinced that the pair of them would be able to escape, but Ping Yang told him to go regardless, and that she, as a woman, would be able to hide herself more easily. So after a short period of hiding, Ping Yang distributed her wealth among several hundred men, obviously gaining their trust and loyalty along the way. She then openly rose up in support of her father. She also sent her servant, who was called Ma San Bao, to persuade other rebel leaders to join her, and a multitude of them did. These were called He Pan Ren, Li Zhongwen, Zhang Shanzi, and Qi Shili. And she then led those rebel leaders and their supporters and captured some of the nearby cities. So in total, she'd amassed a force of 70,000 men. So, following Pingyang's victories, Li Wan crossed the Yellow River into the Chang'an area and sent Chai Shao, who'd successfully escaped and met up with Li Wan after Princess Pingyang had told him to, to rendezvous with Pingyang. They both commanded separate wings of the army and were granted the role of general, and Pingyang's force was known as the Army of the Lady, because there'd never been an army that had been uh, led by a female in Chinese history before. So the following year, Li Wan had Emperor Yang's grandson yield the imperial throne to him and he established the Tang Dynasty and he crowned himself as Emperor Gaozu and his daughter as Princess Pingyang for her help in creating his victory. Princess Pingyang unfortunately died a few years later in 623, but interestingly her father ordered her a grand military funeral like a military general would have. 
However, ministers in the Ministry of Rights denied this opportunity, arguing that it was not suitable for a band to perform at a woman's funeral. However, Emperor Gaozu responded, As you know, the princess mustered an army which helped us overthrow the Su dynasty. She participated in many battles and her help was decisive in founding the Tang dynasty. She was no ordinary woman. And in the end, she did have a state funeral that was fit for a military general. So I thought that was a really interesting female character. And the second one is the only one that I'd heard of prior to this, and you might have heard of her as well. So number two is Empress Wu Jitan, and she was born on the 17th of February 624, and she died on the 16th of December 705. So in over three millennia of imperial rule, Wu Jitan was the only woman to ever rule China in her own right. So no list of famous Chinese women is complete without her, regardless if that's from the medieval period or not. So Wu was born on the 17th of February 624 in Lijiao in China under the Tang dynasty that we just mentioned earlier and her father was a wealthy man. Because of her father's wealth and social status and everything, um, she received a good education, which was, as you can imagine, unusual for women at that time. And she was taken to be a concubine of Emperor Taizong, who reigned from 626 to 49 when she was just aged 14. But, and this is a quote from Taizong, due to her beauty and intelligence, the emperor promoted her to be his secretary instead. However, while Taizong was still alive, Wu had an affair with his son, a guy called Li Zhu. Taizong died in 649 and Li succeeded him as Emperor Gaozhong. In Tang China, when an emperor died, it was expected that all concubines shave their heads and live their lives out of court in chastity. However, Gaozhong ordered Wu back to court almost as soon as he had taken the imperial throne. In 654, Wu gave birth to a baby but it sadly died. But she accused Empress Wang, who was the emperor's wife, of murdering the baby out of jealousy. Gaozhong believed Wu and deposed his wife. So Wu became his consort the following year. However, some historians think that Wu murdered her own baby in order to frame Empress Wang in a power struggle, which, given the nature of Wu's character that we'll find in a minute, wouldn't be uh, unbelievable, let's put it that way. So Gaozhong died in 683, and Wu became Empress Dowager to her son Li Zhe, who became Empress Zhongzhong. However, he showed signs of disobeying his mother, so with her allies, she sent him into exile, and her youngest son, who was called Li Dan, became Emperor Ru Zhong instead. It's little surprise that Ru Zhong never appeared at court, um, due to his mother's controlling nature and demeanour. In 690, Wu deposed him and declared herself Empress Regnant. Empress Wu then declared that she had established her own dynasty, and she called it the Zhu dynasty, which was actually named after the long-reigning ancient Chinese dynasty of the same name, which reigned China from 1046 to 256 BC. So, as a result, this period was known as the Wu Zhu dynasty, but as Wu was the only, only ruler, it doesn't really fit in with a traditional dynasty, because a traditional dynasty involves a number of successors from one family, and the Wu Zhu dynasty, sorry for any spoilers, ended with just her. So Wu was known as a cruel ruler and she had thousands of her rivals' families imprisoned and numerous aristocrats murdered as well. However, she was strangely viewed as a popular and much-loved monarch. But this is worth mentioning that it's worth looking into these sources here, looking who wrote them, what position they had, because no one's going to, you know, criticise her um, if they're anywhere near her court. So part of it, but nevertheless, part of this is due to her coming to the throne at a time of relative economic stability, and also that many of her suggestions for reform came from the people themselves. Um, as well as this, she also pursued a policy of military expansionism, extending China's borders to its furthest extent in Central Asia. You'll see a map on your screen about now. Uh, while also reclaiming territory which had been lost to the Tibetan Empire in 670. She also reopened the Silk Road, which had been closed since 682 due to outbreaks of plague and nomadic tribes who were killing travellers. So by the late 690s, Wu was actually forced to abdicate as she was spending more time with her young lovers rather than ruling China, and she abdicated in favour of her exiled son, Zhong Zong, who was reinstated as Emperor of the Tang Dynasty. And Wu died a year later, aged 81, and with her died the short-lived Wu Zhu Dynasty. But even so, she deserves a place on this list for being the only woman to rule China, Imperial China, in her own right. So we'll fast forward to the 11th century, now 11th, early 12th century, and we'll come across a character called Li Qingzhao, who's number three on our list. 
So, not all of the women on this list, this was something I was conscious to do, by the way, that not all of the women on this list are members of the royal imperial families. I wanted people who weren't necessarily just members of the royal families, I wanted, inverted commas, ordinary people, as ordinary as you can get and find these sources from nearly a thousand years ago. So, Li Qingzhou is an example of this. She was a poet, and she's one of the most famous Chinese women of the medieval era. So she was born in 1084 in Jinan, Shandong, which is on the eastern coast of China, during the Song Dynasty, and the Song Dynasty ruled China from 960 to 1279. Her father was an academic professor, and her mother was also a poet, and Li received a good education too, and she studied literature apparently incredibly well during her teen years, which as you can imagine with her being a poet would have helped her massively. So when she was 18, she married a man called Zhao Ming Cheng, who was an essayist, poet, and politician. And together they collected inscriptions and calligraphy, and it's reported that they had a happy marriage. So Li's happy marriage was actually reflected in the nature of her poetry, which is reported that it took on a calm and elegant tone. So as both Li and Zhao, her husband, were keen poets, they often wrote poems for each other, describing items that fascinated them, such as bronze architecture from the Shang Dynasty and Zhu Dynasty. And just so quick uh, to let you know, the Shang Dynasty was another ancient Chinese dynasty which ruled China from about 1570 to 1045 BC. So a long, long time ago, because they collected some of this stuff as well, some architecture from there. However, though, with the onset of the Jin Song Wars, which ran from about 1125 to 1234, Li and Zhao were forced to flee south of the Yangtze River and they settled in Nanjing. Zhao sadly died a year later, which left Li devastated, and she moved to a place called Hang Zhao, and her poetry during this period of her life was often full of nostalgic memories of her husband. It wasn't the calm, elegant, loving tone that it had taken on during her early years. Um, Li died around 1155, when she was aged approximately 71. But unfortunately, during the turbulent years that followed because of the Jinsong Wars, the majority of her work was lost and only around 100 poems remain to this day, which is really sad because there's probably some fascinating artworks and cultural works as well that have just been lost to war, unfortunately. However, though, her legacy does live on. There are various memorial halls dotted around China which are named after her, as well as, and this one's quite interesting, two craters on the planets Mercury and Venus. I'm not sure about Mercury... Um, but my theory is probably Venus because Venus was obviously the goddess of love some of her poetry is written in that sense but then I've just said I don't know and it's just come to me there that Mercury was the messenger god wasn't he if I'm, if I'm wrong let me know in the comments something but I think Mercury is the messenger god so I'd guess again messaging and writing so you've got writing and then you've got love I suppose it makes sense that craters on those planets are named after her so we'll move on to number four on the list. Sorry if this is going a bit quick and there's not much detail, but it's just from the sources that I can find. Unfortunately, there's not loads of material about them. But anyway, we'll move on to number four, and she's a woman called Guan Dao Sheng, and she lived from 1262 to 1319. So much like Li King Zhao, Guan Dao Sheng was remembered for her cultural significance, making her another one of the famous Chinese women on this list who was not a member of the nobility. She was a painter and calligrapher. So she was born in Huzhou in eastern China around 1262, and she received a good education and was evidently highly talented. Her father thought very highly of her from the moment she was born, because her name, Guan Dao Sheng, literally translates as Way of Righteousness Rising as the Sun. So when Guan was around 24 years old, she married a man called Zhao Meng Fu, who was a renowned artist at the time. So like Li, the, they married into people who were like similar of similar interests to them. So they raised four children together, as well as Zhao's children from a previous marriage, and due to the nature of Zhao's work as an imperial calligrapher, painter and scholar, they travelled around China regularly, and this gave Guan access to meet leading artists of the era, and also gave her the opportunity to visit places and see artworks that many women would not have had access to at the time. So she had a real good advantage there with her, her husband's position, which obviously inspired some of her artwork as well. I'm not taking anything away from her, I was just mentioning that as well. So after Kublai Khan, who you've guessed it, was a descendant of Genghis Khan, video card in the top right corner about now if you want to check out that video, 
Uh, after Kublai Khan had finalised the Mongol conquest of China and formally established the Wan Dynasty, which ruled China from 1279 to 1368, he wanted the most chi talented Chinese scholars to help establish cultural control over the Chinese population. And Zhao was deemed as one of these scholars and he was employed by Kublai Khan. And again, this gave Guan the opportunity to display her own works at the Imperial Court too. So much of her work depicts the traditional style of Chinese art, using fine brush strokes to paint scenes of ink bamboo, and it's also believed that both Zhao and Guan painted many works together. So I've put a few images, images on the screen now, and you might notice that when, I certainly do anyway, when I think of these Chinese paintings, I think of, you know, the koi carp and like the jungle scenes, and it's this style of ink bamboo that Guan was renowned for, so chances are it's probably one of her paintings that you've seen when you've seen that kind of artwork. So, anyway, in 1319, Guan died after a long illness. So, following her death, Zhao painted numerous bamboo paintings in her honour and memory, because that was one of her favourite subjects to paint. And her tombstone was interestingly marked in the same way as would be given to a feudal lord, once again reinforcing the high honour that had been bestowed upon her, and the impact that she had on both Chinese art and culture. So, already we're up to the final... Uh, famous Chinese woman from medieval China on this list and she's called Senge Reiji or Raji and she was born in circa 1283 and she died in 1331 so she was a late 13th and early 14th century collector of Chinese calligraphy and works of art from the Song Dynasty so she was born around 1283 and she was actually a great granddaughter of Kublai Khan and she had three brothers, one was a stepbrother and the other two were full biological brothers. And the latter of two, latter two became emperors. Who They were Emperor Kaishan, who reigned from 1307 to 11, and Emperor Ayer Bawada, who reigned from 1311 to 1320. And this is where she rose to fame and gained prominence within the Chinese courts because of her brother's position as well. And she was granted the titles of Grand Princess of Lu and Princess Supreme of Lu in 1307, which was the Grand Princess title was usually reserved for Imperial Aunts, but she was given that title anyway. So in 1323, Senge hosted an elegant gathering, which was a historic moment because it was held by a woman. These sorts of events before had only ever been held by men. So numerous scrolls were brought to, out to the attendees who were instructed to add colophons to them, which were sort of descriptions about them. So about 15 of these still survive today, and she was also noted for her charitable acts as a result of her Buddhist faith. So a year later, Senge's daughter Budashiri married Chu Temur, who was Budashiri's own cousin and Senge's nephew. Chu Temur helped in increase his mother-in-law's position considerably when he ascended the throne in 1328, and he granted her huge sums of money so that she could build her own residence and own plots of land. Unfortunately though, Senge died in early 1331, so she didn't have much time to enjoy her new residence. However, thanks to her charitable work and her collection of arts and cultural items, she deserves a place on this list of Chinese women from medieval China. So I know it's probably a bit of a shorter one today, but I just wanted to know what you think of this format of maybe occasionally doing five characters from wherever or ten characters, five key moments. If you like it, let me know. If you prefer me to focus on one battle, one conflict, one person, also just let me know, but I'd appreciate any feedback. Um, so thanks for listening, and I'll catch you at the next one.